Jordan here, Front Towards Gamer. It's day three packs. Everybody's starting to feel the wear. We're kind of, uh, yeah, tired. <laughs> I have Trent here who's going to talk to us about Armella today. Uh, it's a very uh, fantasy world based uh, RPG, but bringing elements of the tabletop yeah. kind of to the world again. Um, and I like that your, your primary position is going to be iPad yeah. out the gate. So that's yep. it, a good platform for that kind of stuff. Um, so for people that might not be familiar with what the game's about, why don't you give them a quick rundown? Yeah, certainly. So I reckon you are pretty much correct, except I would say it's the other way around. So it's a board game with RPG elements. Yep. So it's like we've got a hex-based board with a palace in the middle, and you're controlling a single hero, and you're moving throughout the board, basically uh, questing around this palace, trying to slay monsters, uh, questing, exploring discovering great treasures, all these different types of things, recruiting followers to your party, all in the hopes of getting becoming powerful enough to become king or queen of Armello before any of the other heroes that are out questing for the throne. And you, you went an interesting way with, not a lot of people focus on, on, on animal kingdoms yep. in that kind of sense. Everybody's used to the straight fantasy, you know, trolls, Elf, dwarves. Wizard, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what made you guys want to push that direction instead? Um, yeah, so, um, like um, as a writer, I'm super like interested. Like I just love the archetypal nature of uh, like fantasy. I'm sorry, fairy tales um, and folklore and stuff like that. And so, and especially with fables, like you know these animal-based stories. One of the guys on the team, uh, one of our directors at League of Geeks, uh, grew up on Redwall, and he just has always wanted to do something with animals and um, you know some type of fantasy thing. And uh, considering that we had a board game, and it's really like. You know, there's not many opportunities for a narrative communication within a board game, you know? So as a narrative designer or the person that that stuff sort of falls onto, I was like, the beauty of like archetypal characters that come with, with you know, with these animals, it's like, okay, what type of character is a weasel? Like instantly you have, you know, the thoughts of what, you know, he's gonna be this sort of roguish type of like tricky sly guy, right. you, know, you know? And so those connotations already being preloaded into the animals is super, super great. Um, for immediacy when people engage with the game. On, on a writing standpoint then, did you find it easier or harder when you're doing that, that assigning to, you know, like traditional archetypes, you know, when you're looking at like the hero cycle yeah. or the, uh, you know, when you start to break down, you know, the, the warrior, yeah. the... Well, it definitely like, you're like, okay, we need a herald. Um, and it's like, all right, oh, uh, wow. Well, what would that be? You know, um, I guess, well, maybe maybe an owl or maybe it'll be like, you know, some old some old badger or something like that. So yeah, there's definitely, it, it's kind of, it almost like writes itself. It's hard not to, I guess the, the hardest part is, and especially even with the art style and things like that, it's hard not to fall into cliches. And I guess that's where execution comes into it. It's like, it's all good and well to say that we get these things for free or that it's easier because we have animals and, you know, things are a lot more immediate, but it's also easy to fall into traps and, uh, yeah. You don't want to get caught in a trope when you're trying to do something different. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, on the art style, I, I mean, I kind of briefly mentioned my pull with yeah. it was it looks very Samurai Jack in its presentation. Right. Because, I mean, if you're familiar with the cartoon, a very cinematic. Yeah. Uh, I, it's one of my favorite masterpiece cartoons to me. Yeah. So you have, you capture that same kind of art style, but you give it even a smoother transition, a smoother kind of. Uh, presentation to where you're not like as harsh lines, but you still keep that kind of palette with it. Did did that present some kind of challenge to make it accessible in the way it looks? But especially when you're doing, you know, you're, you're it's a board game in essence too, so you're not wanting to be overcomplicated. Yeah, no, totally. So um, it was the art styles are really, it's a really interesting thing. So we spent a long time on that. I guess with. With animals, um, when you're doing anthropomorphic animals, you can have on one, there, there's two ends to the scale. On one end, you've got cutesy Disney animals, where it's just like, you look at it and it's a kid's, it's a kid's thing straight away. And then on the other end, you've got sexy wolves and six packs, you know, and it, like, it can get really crazy really quickly. So, you know, trying to do something like, something really interesting and something that when people see it is like immediately um, mellow, like it, it, it's really unique to us. Um, it's, it's not a path trotter before, was really tricky. So. Um, what I think what you're hitting on is those clean silhouettes that we have. That's very much like the style of Tartowski and you know um, uh, with uh, Samurai Jack. You know, so it's like Samurai Jack, Clone yeah, Wars, yeah, Clone uh, Wars, yeah. all that sort of stuff. You know, these nice clean silhouettes, these strong poses. Um, 
that's and that's definitely something that we see in Anala, like those really classical, like uh, strong poses with the clean silhouettes. But then also, I guess where we differ from that sort of style is that we have the the real uh, fine detail within those clean silhouettes, and that, that's the Anala style. I guess. Did you find it was a challenge trying to bring that that tabletop element to the iPad, but keeping that narrative strong? Sorry, what was that there? So, did you find it hard to uh, bring the tabletop element? I mean. Tabletop's huge history of yep. narrative, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, yep. Pathfinder, stuff like that. But keep the narrative? Yeah, but keep that narrative strong because sometimes that's get lost in game, it's yeah. games. I, you know? I'm so glad you said that because you're so right. So, And this was right from the start, this was one of the most important things to me is with board games, um, sometimes like they're the most amazing things. Like it's super experience and the power of them is so evocative. But something like just because of their, in, their inherent. Um, Disadvantages by being a physical on a, a physical medium. Um, it, it's just it can't be as immediate as as a video ga game can be in some in some forms. Like it's some things are super abstracted. A, a great example in Armello is in Armello when you're stealth, you're stealth. People just can't see you on the board. Like your character just won't appear. In a in a tabletop game when you're stealth, the characters on the board, you're rolling dice against someone's stealth rating, and then someone says, "Oh no, you can't see me." Right. So there's this real disconnect. There's this. this there's a very high suspension of disbelief that people have to have. Um, and so with, that was one of the biggest things with Armello. One of our pillars was to just really draw that out of the tabletop game. Pull that story right to the top. That's why we have a world where the hex tiles, even little things that we bust over for weeks that seem minor but like really contribute. So our hex tiles are seamless. So when you look at the board, you can see that things are roughly hexes, but you won't actually see where they meet up until it's your turn and then we lay down the select the tile highlighters of where you can go right and like even choosing to take them away when it's not your turn right like all these sorts of things um having fully animated heroes having a day night cycle um you know having fully 3d world all that sort of stuff beautiful soundtrack the atmosphere that's where we're really bringing out the narrative you know it's not just about the writing or anything like that it's about the experience and the embedded narrative within the world and evoking that sense of a place, um, Armello. You want to pull people into the secondary yeah, totally. world and not just say, oh, hey, you're playing a game. And that's why we do things like why we have an animated trailer. That's why we released, uh, as our announced trailer, a fully animated trailer. It didn't show any gameplay footage at all. Um, a lot of people, I know that pissed off like some people, they were like, hey, where's where's the gameplay footage? And it's that's because, you know, right now that's not important. What's important is the mood of the world, is what we're going for with Armello is the place that you will you will inhabit when you play this game. So, the, and once you've seen these animated trailers, and once you once you've experienced what we feel Armello is, then when you finally get into that game, you like you're taking so much more to that game. And I think that's a beautiful way to do it. I, like I looked at the trailer and I was just wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it yeah, looks great. And just from a storyteller's perspective, that's to be able to pull people in in that essence and then you know introducing the game in that world yeah. you're, you're already taking a step into developing your characters you know giving them that human touch that's gonna you know make people sympathize with yeah. them or or you know hate them out the gate you yeah. know depending which way you look at it but it's i like to think you're going the right way about that <laughs> Thank you. you know it's super important to us like that world being somewhere that people so we want people when they put down a game of our mellow it's not just like oh yeah, I played that game and it was like, I got, got, did that really good thing and we had these stats and, and you know, that I rolled the dice and that was a really good dice roll and I, I, I'm glad I buffed my character. Like, that's not the type of things, like, that's cool. And we all like that, but that's like your, that's micro thoughts. Like, that's not, when people go to bed, I want them to, you know, after playing a game of Armello, you know, on the couch downstairs on their iPad, I want them to be thinking, fuck, I wish I lived in Armello. Like, you know, I wish I lived there. I, what, what would I be? Imagine if I was like, you know, like a, a, a wolf prince in Armello or where's that, you know, that rogue that I recruited to my party, um, you know, I wonder what he gets up to. Like, those are the sort of questions that are interesting, you know, when you're creating worlds. Um, that's really what, I, what interests me. Were there any big challenges you had when, when creating that kind of thing? I mean, obviously everybody's going to have a different trait in terms of race because just you know, an animal, I mean, a rabbit's not going to be as powerful as a wolf necessarily, or... Did you find that uh, kind of interesting to do to, to when balancing this world out to try to craft it and make it accessible for everyone? Yeah, it is. For example, there's just some things that's like, you know, you go to, when you get like four heroes on a spreadsheet, you can just like bump their stats around however you want. But as soon as you're like, oh, well, as soon as you then look at some of the heroes, you're like, oh, well, we can't actually make the bear's health lower than everyone else because she's, she's just huge. Like she's a bear, right? So it's like, you know, there's some inherent difficulties there with that sort of stuff. Um, 
but you know, that's stuff that you encounter in any video game, and I think that's that's part of the process. Like game design is just answering questions. You know, it's like game design is you know finding solutions within a set of constraints and a set of challenges. And uh, and, I, and I like I, I guess we relish in being being faced with them. <laughs> um, so you're like I said, we're doing you're doing iPad first. Yep. Um, what's your relative window where you're looking to kind of spread it across the board in terms of? Because you said Android as well. Yep. Um, you got a time frame date. Yeah, so the, the official <laughs> answer is when it's ready. So Fair it's a passion project. You know, we've got an indie development collective in Melbourne, so we've got no publisher screaming down our throat saying it has to be done now. So it's just a bit, but of course, you know, we'll get up, run out of money at some point. So it's like, we will just make sure that this game is right. That's what's the most important thing for us. But when we put it in people's hands, it's what we've said it will be and that it's this the experience that we want them to have. And, um, but saying that, you know, who knows, I think we maybe got like a, a year, a year plus maybe in development. So next time, sometime next year, I reckon we'll see after. Well, just looking at it right now, it already looks pretty polished. So yeah, thank you very much. But uh, I want to thank you for taking a little bit of time with me today. I do thank appreciate you. it. Thank Cheers, you. Jordan. Till next time, guys.